Nigeria moves to allow Twitter work in the country again. But what is the real cost of the ban on the social media site? We'll be finding out this morning. Resume across Europe with a lot of excitement. You know, Messi will be playing outside La Liga for the first time. And Romelu Lukaku is back to Chelsea. We'll talk all about that. Plus our regulars of the press and top trending and also today in history. Say good morning and welcome to a Friday morning on Plus TV Africa. It is the breakfast. Thanks for joining us. I am Osaogi Ogbawa. And I am Aneta Felix. Good morning to you and good morning, Osaogi. Morning to you. So our top trending story today, the first one, I found I find it both hilarious and saddening because it's something we've seen time and time again. And that's the conflict between religion, right? We've talked about how pastors defraud members. You know, even these members going ahead to protest, you know, in churches and things like that. Now, what we're seeing with Pastor uh, or Apostle John Suleiman, we don't really have the details clear yet because, you know, they've taken this to the police. It's still been investigated and all of that. But the story is that Apostle John Suleiman had transferred money to members of his church, both in Edo State and out of the country. And this particular um, concerned citizen, you know, took this up with his own means of investigation, um, going ahead to say that this was fake, this was a scam, and that uh, Pastor John Sinema was using money angels um, to basically defraud his members. And um, there were publications online that surfaced yesterday. Um, the church has responded, you know, saying, yeah, they have a right to express themselves, but that they were wrong in the accusations. And they took this up and um, arrested the man involved. Um, his lawyer, Inibe if Young, said that he spent about 10 hours in, 10 hours in cell with his, um, with his client. And that's after meeting all the stringent bail conditions except one. So the issue here, you know, the issues here are, are many. First of all, the church and money it's, is something that we've debated for a long time. Apostle John Suleiman has been in the news for controversial reasons many times before, but we understand his huge following and you can understand, you know, people who come out on social media to defend him, even though we don't know the facts of the case as of yet. Well, the, 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 the facts of the case are pretty simple. Um, according to Inbehe Efiong, who is representing uh, Israel Balogun. Israel Balogun is the guy who was arrested. Um, apparently, Apostle John Suleiman had claimed that he... Um, had uh, angels send money to you know, certain members of the church um, and also some people in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, I believe. Um, you know, and of course, they received alerts you know, from these angels. And so uh, Israel Balogun, of course, you know, on his own platform, you know, you know, spoke up and debunked those claims and said that it's not possible that angels will send money to anybody and um, you know, all of that. Um, he then, of course, Apostle Suleiman then wrote a petition to the Nigerian police, uh, who then picked up Israel Balogun and um, accused him of uh, defamation and cyber stalking or some, you know, some, you know, whatever. So that he was is. saying he was calling him a Yahoo man, a fraudster, working in yeah, connection so, with Rush Puppy. Which he, he obviously has a right to do, you know, and everybody has their Twitter platform as long as it's not right in any what? way. He, he should share, share his thoughts on what he feels. If he feels like you you're Mr. lying, Balogo. he will say you're lying, yes. Okay. If he feels that you're being fraudulent, he should say that you're being fraudulent. If he, of course, can back up those claims. And the challenge here now is, you know, according to Inibehe Efing, because I watched a video yesterday where Inibehe Efing is then saying, if you feel like Israel Balogun was wrong, then show us these angels. Bring these people who received a lot from angels. Let's look at their bank statements and see which angels sent money to them, including the person who's in Atlanta, Atlanta Georgia. And then, then, of course, went further to say that why don't we also use these angels to fund Edo State and fund the Nigerian, Nigerian economy if angels can send money to, to um, a person or send mm. money to, you know, to people's bank accounts? So it's, it, the, the case is pretty simple. It's a pretty simple case. What the challenge really is here, how... And it's going back to, of course, me referring to the Hush Puppy case mm -hmm. where, you know, um, uh, fraud stars, basically, and anybody can use that level of influence to ask the police to do their bidding. And that's exactly what it is. And so he, you know, like Hush Puppy did, 
you know, with the Vincent case, asked Oga Super Cup, uh, aka, you know, uh, Barbaric uh, Seller, to arrest Vincent for his own personal reasons. And of course, they went ahead and did it and locked him up and beat him, you know, up, according to these allegations, mm -hmm. beat him up until he was, you know, hospitalized. It's pretty much the same thing with, with this case. Now, um, Israel Balogun was arrested, was sent to uh, the police station in Garki. And then they gave him very, very stringent bail conditions that you would expect for a murderer or a kidnapper or someone who has committed very, very serious crimes and not, you know, for someone who simply debunked your claims on his own social media platform. And that's really what the, the case is about. Why does, you know, Apostle Suleiman not allow that someone will be able to say, okay, I don't believe in the things that you've said? And why is the police so easy to do the bidding of supposed rich or um, influential people in Nigeria. That's really what this whole case is about. It's embarrassing, both for the Nigerian police and, and for um, Apostle Suleiman. And I hope that as this case progresses, that he will be able to at least show that his claims were true. And angels actually did send money to these people, where these angels came from, how much they received, and, you know, some of all those extra really details a, uh, necessary here. Fly fees. Yeah, you know, <laughs> if, if the angel, angel is using BVN or what or whatnot. <laughs> there, there has to be... Because, wow. because, listen, Christianity has, has suffered so much from characters who set up church as a source of income, as a business. And it's one of the reasons a lot of people these days would say, okay, I'd rather just stay at home and speak to my God than go to any church because I don't even believe in these churches anymore. And it's not saying that all of the churches are fraudulent. There's some, I believe, that some really, really genuine um, you know, Christian bodies. But... Because of these, you know, cases here and there where pastors can do whatever it takes to ensure that they grow their numbers and they grow their following and grow their popularity, that's why the Christianity itself has continued to suffer. But to be honest, right, if um, Apostle John Silliman can believe in the extraordinary of using angels to send money to followers, I wonder why he didn't, you know, go that route when it comes to finding justice because why then do you do you have to go ahead and involve the police i mean that's that's a form of injustice yes. on its own because you feel that you have the funds to do so because you feel that you can buy you know those police officers and who those people will just go ahead and arrest people simply because that's, that's, it, it that's, just seems unfair and then when you look at the bail conditions that's just another kettle of fish these issues continue with our law enforcement our judiciary and I really don't know when this will end. Um, I was just going to chip in. There is, um, I don't think we need to go too far, you know, to determine whether these miracles actually happen. It didn't happen. Um, there's no need to argue, you know, the level this of faith that you have. This investigation should actually be easy to conduct. Yeah. There's no need to be digging deep into the kind of faith that you have. Bank records. You know, to show that angels sent anybody money. It didn't happen. Neither did any Babalao. Neither did it. Nobody, you know, from the spiritual realm paid money into anybody's account. They might as, as well just brought cash to you instead of paying in, in, into your account. So it, all, these, all these claims, you know, did not in any way happen. And there's no need going too far. I really want to hear the side of Apostle John Suleiman. Like, I want to have him address this issue because, you know, when I started, you know, talking about this, I mentioned that we don't have all the facts because what we just saw is that, uh, you know, letter he wrote back, the petition. But we want to hear from Pastor, Pastor Apostle John Suleiman help us break down exactly what he meant when he said it was angels that sent that money. We want to get the details, we want to get the facts. And then we can look at both sides and say, okay, maybe things actually happen supernaturally that we, you know, that's just beyond our comprehension. I want to give him that benefit of the doubt. Well, um, we're, hopefully we get to speak with Inibah Fiong himself, uh, who's a lawyer to the accused. All right, so in Lagos, the um, Lagos State Government has actually shut down about 20 different uh, pharmacies and patent medical clinics. And, you know, this was in certain areas and in Shomolu, Bariga, Oronshoki, areas of Lagos State. Um, they said that these, um, it was a statement actually from the State Commissioner for Health, Professor Aki Abayomi, yesterday, Thursday. He said that these affected pharmacies and patent medicine stores had contravened certain regulations um, that guides the operation of pharmacies and patent medical stores that they were indulging in illegal practices, they were failing to comply with um, regulatory standard. You know, it just went on and on and, you know, quoting sections of um, the um, Provisions Act of 1999 talking about fake drugs, you know, counterfeit medicines and all of that. So 
There were concerns with how these drugs were stored. There were concerns with the fact that they didn't have um, enough license or the approved licenses, that they were selling drugs that were not approved. So just lots of concerns there. Um, I think that's a good one, but um, my question really would be how many people have been victims of these counterfeit medicines? You know, how late really did they come? Yeah. Because we know people um, who've heard experiences, even if we don't know anyone personally, who've heard experiences of people, you know, falling victim to fake medication. I've heard of people who died simply because they, take, they took fake malaria medication. So if these um, drugstores have been able to function, operate for months and maybe even years, you know, it makes me ask questions, why now? Why did it take so long before, you know, these people were caught? What does it take to open a pharmacy store? Do you just go ahead, rent a shop and just paint it white and start, you know, stocking up drugs? You know, really, how late was this action? Well, you know, it's, it's obvious that there's a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done with regards to uh, um, cleaning up uh, what Nigerians consume. Um, you know, NAVDAC, of, of course, has had that responsibility for a long time. People have criticized NAVDAC uh, for not being as effective as they should. But, of course, I'm sure that they also do what they can um, with the resources available to them. Uh, the Lagos State government, of course, you know, has, you know, taken that responsibility also to protect, you know, residents of Lagos from these fake medicine stores and these, um, you know, on um, registered, uh, you know, medicine stores or off-the-counter medicine stores. So there's a, there's a lot of work. And, you know, you cannot really in any way quantify the damage that these stores you know may have caused to residents of lagos you know, the healthcare system in nigeria is not you know big or strong enough to be able to verify what a person you know um, the, the the cause of a person's sickness um you know that may have come from a fake you know drug that the person bought um some of these things could cause cancer some of these things could you know cause um you know um, organ damage you know and and we there's so much work that needs to be done and that also includes those guys in the market, if you go to any very you know, small market around Lagos, you must see some of all those guys selling drugs in, in wheelbarrows or have very, very, very small Even on shop. the roads, that's um, Balinde, they're there, yeah, you know, you know, in Yaba, they're just in the open air. Which, you know, are not in any way uh, registered with, you know, the Nigerian Pharmaceutical, Pharmaceutical Society or any, any of all those um, organizations. And so there's so much work that needs to be done. Unfortunately, yes, I understand drugs are expensive. A lot of people can't afford drugs in the big, you know, named pharmacies uh, across Lagos. But at the same time, you know, we also need to not use that excuse of how expensive drugs are to poison ourselves. You know, I also get to see, and, you know, I don't know how this happens, but those people who sell some things in bottles with tree, leaves. They call and, them ago, uh, they call them yeah, herbs, those, they call them... Yeah, those things, yeah. So, so I'm not... They're now even being sold on social media. So it's almost you yeah, know, but the I, mainstream now. Yeah, but I, I think that we... I, I don't know. I feel, you know, there has to be some level of... Some regulation. level of regulation with those things also, because I don't know how they work. And I've seen people buy those things and they say, give me 15 naira of this and 20 naira of this and, you know, 100 naira of that. And they all mix everything in the bottle and chicken and it's brownish and looking very See, odd. See, the fact is, when it, it comes to herbs, right, herbs, when you even look at, you know, religious texts like the Bible, you know, it talks about God giving us herbs for medicine, right? And it is in, indeed fact that there are some herbs that you can grow or, you know, get in the wild or purchase yeah. that can help, you know, cure some ailment. And we know these traditional agbo sellers in Lagos, in the western parts of the country, you know, where they sell these things, they're able to, they, they have knowledge of these things, they're able to mix them for you. But the challenge now is not with the herbs and, you know, the efficacy. It's not people who are trying to exploit that for the purpose of making money, who now take that a step further. They now have factories that are, you know, unapproved. I've heard of people bribing an AVDAC and SON just so that they can get their approval to manufacture those things in their houses. But, you know, that, that one is a, valid, is a valid issue that should be looked into. But the issue of people now going further to purchase fake medication from countries in Asia and bring it here, knowing fully well that these drugs are not good enough. These drugs actually are counterproductive to your health. That is... I mean, this should be punishable by That's the law. This, so, this, this is a serious offense you're, because you're, you're intentionally... I think okay. you're going too far even talking about Asia. There's a lot of these drugs that are just Manufactured chalk. here. It's just chalk, really. You know, and it's packaged. It's, you know, beautifully packaged and, you know, given a name that everybody knows and that's it. Um, that, or even really one letter change that you, you, you won't, you, if, yeah. you, if you're not extra careful, you won't notice that it's fake. There's a lot of 
times, I'm sure everyone was experienced this, when they take a medication and it doesn't work. Um, they buy medication from a pharmacy, maybe not a very, very big name pharmacy, but they, you know, get some drugs, they take it and it doesn't work. It's out of two things, either your body has, you know, started to either not function with that particular medication, you need to increase your dosage, um, or, you, or you look for a different brand, or that is just fake medicine. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's really what it is. So um, there's so much work that needs to be done. You know, I, I always like to be tech. in the middle and say, yeah, I always like to be in the middle and say, I understand, you know, the concerns of people and being able to afford medication in some of these pharmacies because there's certain types of even paracetamol that you get to into a pharmacy these days and tell you it's 3,000 naira or 4,000 naira for just a card of paracetamol or Panadol. Um, but of course, the roadside sellers will sell that same thing, you know, for you know, for two or two hundred naira, or hundred naira. So I understand Even the concerns buses. with, with you know, with being able to afford some of uh, these medications. But mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done so that we can at least um, reduce the amount of people who fall sick or have terminal illnesses from buying drugs in some of these uh, med medicine stores. And everybody should go through some type of regulation, including their go sellers. Uh, it's not banning them, you know, and I understand, yes, I, like you mentioned, you know, herbs are um, important. They are part of the things that, you know, are also medicinal. But I feel like there should be just even some just a little of bit of regulation, yeah. even if it's just in the hygiene aspects of it. You know, how are these things made? Where are they made from? You know, uh, the, the places where they are, you know, mixed and, and produced, are they clean enough for, you know, consumption later on all of that? So we don't start a new virus here in Nigeria. Yes. And um, lastly, our top trending story is about security. So we know that the southern governors have been, you know, meeting recently, talking about ways to end, you know, this farmer's headers crisis and all of that. And they had set a timeline for September to fully implement the anti-open grazing law. Um, but um, it's August 12th and we saw the Osho Assembly passing this anti-open grazing bill. You know, they're saying that... Um, to make sure that farmers and herders clash are reduced and they said that it's criminalizing um, open grazing in ocean state and this is meant to prevent the killing of farmers is to prevent um, sexual molestation and um, environmental degradation pollution it says when this bill becomes law no person or group of person shall rear herd or graze any livestock in any parts of the state except within permitted ranches so it seems they haven't plans to have, you know, certain ranches where within which you can go ahead and graze. And then outside that is definitely is illegal. They've also prohibited, you know, ranching by minors. You can see, obviously, that that guy looks like a teenager. Yeah. And you see lots of them, you know, holding their sticks and, you know, shepherding their cattle. So it's criminalizing, you know, minors doing that. And the bill is also stipulating a three-year imprisonment without the option of fine if you contravene that law. So, um, like I mentioned, other states, you know, they've all come together to say by September they should be able to um, make this among um, uh, all southern states. Um, we've heard people in the breakfast that we've had um, representing the Cattle Breeders Association saying that, oh, this will backfire. They have so and so million amounts of, of cattle herders across the country. This will destabilize us to, you know, lots and lots of threats. But... Let's see if this will be one of the solutions finally. We've heard lots of anti-open grazing, anti-open grazing, but it really doesn't hold much water. It just seems like it doesn't go beyond the headlines. When it comes to actual implementation in those states, do the state governments go ahead to make sure that that's a reality? So what steps are they taking? Are they enforcing more border control? Are they actually creating those ranches? Are they communicating with these herders in those communities to let them know that this is what you need to do if you want to rear cattle? So there's a lot of background work that needs to be done before, you know, these things just become law. Because, you know, at the fundamental level of lawmaking, consultation with stakeholders is key. Yeah. What do you think, Kasari? So um, um, I think, well, like, I agree with, you know, most of what you said. I think, you know, it's a first step. Um, it's a big step, you know, but it's a first step also with regards uh, protecting lives and property of, you know, people in the you know, Nigerians generally. Um, and the governors have made their, you know, taken their decision. Um, and everybody needs to, you know, go with it, you know, um, because the, the, the lives that have been lost because of the grazing and the farmers' headers clashes have, have, have been too much to just ignore in Nigeria. You know, the, the conversation about justice for these lives, 
it's a totally diff different conversation. That's a wider conversation. But for now, I think, you know, these steps need to be taken. But at the same time, it's also important that they start to look with regard to state police and look at how they can better protect residents of their states. Because some of all these killings and kidnappings don't happen because of cattle. Some of them are really just um, murder that happens. I've, I've been seeing reports of, you know, Enugu State lately, um, um, you know, that are very, very uh, troubling. But I don't think that has a lot to do with cattle. Um, so whatever is necessary that needs to be done, they should go ahead and do it. If they feel like the ban on open grazing, you know, is important, then yes, they should go ahead and do that. But at the same time, security needs to be improved. Nigeria's security, you know, setup is too poor um, for, for, you know, for, for a country of 200 million people, the giant of Africa, it's, it's just too poor. Mm. And we don't have enough you know, police officers, we don't have enough you know, information technology with regards to um, uh, security, we don't have enough of anything concerning security. Indeed. And, and, and a lot and needs to be done. If, if I am to make any recommendation, it's be that this state policing thing should you know, be concluded soon enough because if this state creation thing goes through, if INEC really does the referendum and states, you know, residents in areas decide that they want their own state, about 20 new states to be created. We would need the recruitment, massive recruitment of, you know, local law enforcement agencies to make sure that, oh. you know, the security doesn't, security challenges, you know, don't escalate. Not very likely, dimension. but um, <laughs> we'll see how it we'll goes. We can barely deal with 36. We'll anyway, let's, let's move <laughs> so you're on. You're good with it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a short break. When we come back, G. Day Johnson will be joining us with Off the Press, and we get to look at the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. <laughs> 